Gospel according to St. John. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you'll raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. So we have a few things going on here. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the temple scene, what we're talking about, what I just read, um, follows Jesus after he enters into Jerusalem. And remember, Jerusalem, birth, crucifixion, resurrection, death. It's the place. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this temple scene follows Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. But in John... It follows the first miracle at the wedding at Cana. Everyone here, how many of you have been taught the Bible? You take it for what it is. The Bible says it. That's it. The final word. Because now you've got a little bit of a problem. Because you have something out of order. It's out of sync. Yet you have four gospel writers, three in agreement, and the timeline. The fourth one, not at all. Let me help you. I'm not saying don't trust the written word of God. Just understand the written word of God has people, personalities in it. It's their story and not just God's story. It's a blending. It doesn't take away the authority of God. It doesn't take away the power of God. For everyone that's caught up in our God is an awesome God, good for you. My God is a loving God that cares about this world, and that's why God came, because of love. Not power, not to overthrow anyone, not that mighty God, but a powerful, loving God, a love that we've never seen before. The scriptures point us to that Jesus. The scriptures are not equal to the living word of God. The scriptures are scriptures. It's a book with 66 letters in it, documents in it, and there were a whole lot more that were considered. But this is what we got three centuries after Jesus walked the planet. The Bible has authority, but do not believe the Bible itself is the living word of God. If there's anything you get out of today, that's what I hope for you to get out of it. Because we are taught so early and we don't get the next level teaching. It's like going to second and third and fourth grade. And we keep it there. We don't advance to middle school. We don't advance to high school. And we certainly never get to graduate school. But there's so much to be learned about the difference between the written word of God and the living word of God. And here's one simple example. And it's a poignant example. The order. It's not in the same order. Okay? Okay? And again, don't challenge the word of God. It's why the word has been written, to challenge our hearts and our minds and to grow into faith, grow into maturity. In John, we see the raising of Lazarus is the thing that finally gets the politicians to want to arrest and kill Jesus. It was the raising of Lazarus in John, that finally put the kibosh on things. So the temple skirmish, 
this thing that's taking place in the temple. In the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the ones that have similar pieces, the ones that took writings from the same document and they shared them and they came, they put it together, that compilation. It's like putting my catechism class together or my adult study class together and they all write things down and next thing you know they're sharing from their papers and then they get to write it again. And, and now it's, boy, I've got a line in here that's from Missy Endy. I've got another line from Kathy Krauss. I've got this paragraph from Matty Robb and we put it all together and it still is God. It's just that God chooses to do something that many people don't believe. God chooses you. God chooses me to be a part of this wonderful plan of redemption and salvation for all people. We are co-creators with God. We're not higher than God. God invites us in and along the journey. I may be the pastor of the church... But I did basically nothing yesterday in the funeral. And when we got to the graveside, I may be the pastor of the church and have the authority and the, oh, I don't have a collar on, the funny collar on and all this stuff. But the reality is Melissa did the burial of her grandfather. It's sharing the work. In our meeting last week, when Missy Endy stood up and referred to some things, and when Donnie Heimbach stood up and referred to some things, and when Becky, Ep Becky Erb stood up and Linda Rohrbach, well, Linda wasn't here. All this work, well, Linda wasn't here, but yet Linda's work was being spoken. All of this, it's us, folks. We are to be invited in. We are asked to be a part of things. And we're given the awesome responsibility to learn and to grow and to do things. So Jesus enters the temple and he finds out what they're doing. Now, I, this is two weeks in a row I'm getting ticked off. Because last week, Peter did, remember I taught last week? Peter did exactly what Jesus said. Don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody. And here's Jesus exposing himself, making everyone, including Peter and the guys, vulnerable the followers of Jesus were now vulnerable because Jesus is saying, this is who I am. And Jesus scolds Peter. Now, he walks into the temple. Wait a minute. The temple traditions are predicated on a marketplace. Go not too far from here, and churches up above Route 78 make their budget by the strawberry pie festivals and the... the Dandelion and ham suppers. You know, they subsidize their work through fundraising. Bad stewardship, but that's besides the point. They subsidize it, and that's what the temple was. The whole idea of having it lined up and having the money changers here, you know, you get two bits for a dove, and you get five for a goat, and then you get whatever over here. That's the tradition of the Old Testament. So, I, I just wonder, have you caught on that when Jesus does this, he's saying of the book, all of this new way of doing things. We didn't throw it out, but I'm not so sure Jesus didn't. And I'm not so sure this story doesn't give us the absolute confirmation for all things new and for doing things in different ways because if I'm correct in my interpretation and it seems to be consistent with all of the conservative biblical scholars that I could dig up instead of concern for the temple stuff that was going on Jesus says don't turn my father's house into a marketplace it's not the temple system that he was criticizing to have it modified. It's that he was calling for a complete dismantling of the entire system. Jesus was asking for the temple system to be completely dismantled. It's done. Jesus is saying it's done. So you know how at times some, some I mean, it doesn't happen often around here, but you know when I and the council and others want to change a couple things and people get restless and they get upset? 
Here's Jesus saying, everything that you've lived on, everything you've breathed, everything you've experienced as a temple, done. Jesus said, I am done. I'm through with it because you're not figuring it out. And here's what he really wasn't figuring out. It's all about, this is so simple. It's so simple. Jesus figured out that all of them were so caught up in believing that God was found in a box. God's location was a box in the temple. And all Jesus wanted to do is say, no. That's not where God is. We don't have God in the box. Crank it up a couple times and he pops out. Yeah. It's not what we have. But the whole world back then, that worldview and that experience in Judaism was God was to be found in the box. And Jesus said, you want to see God? Look at me. The son of the living God was present, living, alive. It wasn't in the scrolls. It wasn't in the written book. It was in the living person of Jesus Christ. Just because you can't see Jesus right now doesn't mean Jesus isn't here. Just because you can't watch our Lord walk down the aisle doesn't mean that our Lord isn't here. See with new eyes. I'm asking you to take off your eyes and put new ones on. There are very few people I've met in my life that when they look at someone, they can see right past the sin. They can see right past their own sin. Because most of us, when we look at another person and we make an assessment of them, here's the tricky part. We actually see nothing but a projection of our own stuff laid onto that person. We see someone walk in and they have grubby clothes on and we automatically make judgment. We might pass judgment. Many of us might pass judgment and say, wow, they don't have any money. Then you find out that it was the millionaire that decided they wanted to build an addition on their house and they were out slopping around the mud. See, we make so many quick judgments. We say the person in a wheelchair without legs can't dance. Instead of realizing the able-bodied white guy that's 64, I'm the one that really can't dance because the guy in the wheelchair was awesome. Jesus is saying it's time to see with new eyes. It's time to let the temple system of the past go. It's time to be invited into a new way of doing things and not to have doves and goats and other things atone, substitute for you as a sacrifice. But our Lord says, I'm going to do it for you. Once and done, I'll go to the altar and I will be the ultimate sacrifice. That's not the story. Yes, that happened. But you're missing the point if all you see is the act of our Lord going to the table to be sacrificed. You're missing the act. It's that it points to God's love. For God so wanted to destroy and take upon all the sin of the world that he sacrificed his son. No, for God so loved the world that he took upon himself to send Jesus. God loved. That's what this text is all about. It always has been. It always will be. God loves you. Start there. Look in a mirror and let your vision of yourself fade away. Look in a mirror and see yourself clothed in righteousness, in glory. Whatever you've done, whatever you're doing, whatever you will do. I'm not saying this gives you a free pass to do crazy things. It's a free pass for you to say, don't let anything hold on to you any longer. Cut the ropes. Be free. God loves you. Now go and love others. As far as scripture, read as much of it as you can. Enjoy it. But if you're reading it only for that book, you're missing out. Read it and let it point you to the living God. What's the way to do that? Read it. Look for what God's up to in the world and how you just saw that passage of Scripture manifest in the world. And go join in and get involved. Go and do. Don't go and sit. Go and do. 
get involved, get engaged, be a part. Oh, we got to do the spiritual gifting now. <laughs> I'm stuck. Sorry. We're doing the class out right after church. In fact, I'm not going to any place. Um, um, you know the rule, we're not, no coffee in the sanctuary? Go downstairs, coffee and conversation, right? Next week. Next week. All right. Today, just sit. Stick around. Stick around. I'll even stop church soon. How's that? Just stick around because we got to talk about spiritual gifts because I'm curious. I'm curious how you could see this. What did Jesus see in this story? What did John see that John wrote it differently? I mean, John's always different. John's a little bit of a whack job. John does things differently. Figure out for yourself who Jesus is. Martha, who's Jesus? And, and, and what does Jesus mean to you? It's not who was Christ. Who is Christ to you, Donnie? Gene, who is Jesus to you now? Bill, who is, who to you is my Lord and my Savior? I want to know. Andy, I want to hear how you understand God active right now, right here in people. Abby, we love you. We love your family. We want everything to be okay for your dad. And we are there. But there's this push and pull. I don't want to sit at home last night when you and your mom said you don't have to go in the hospital because you might just irritate them more. Well, that's one of my gifts. <laughs> that's a spiritual gift of mine. I just like irritating the heck out of people. <laughs> Didn't have any argument on that, did I? <laughs> Jesus is the presence of God. So our focus is to get close to Jesus. Amen? Amen. All right.